So to, to kick off things, um, maybe I'd like to in, in, invite each of the panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Um, I'm, I'm going to go on strictly alphabetical order, which puts Andy up first, followed by Anne, followed by Brian, which gives him a chance to, to, to log in. So, <laughs> so Andy, could I invite you to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Paul. Um, Andy O'Sullivan, um, I'm part of the of the incubator team, which is, which is basically in innovation team, emerging technology, kind of a lot of stuff with Liberty IT, which is an IT company based in Dublin and Belfast and we're part of the Liberty Mutual kind of global insurance group. So, 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 so it's a kind of, a, so I tend to come from kind of an enterprise view of innovation. So kind of a quite practical one, but um, like really interested in air and VR for like, a, so as for, <laughs> as long as I can remember more or less, but kind of, um, I always have a practical add on because like what we care about is business value more than anything else, you know? Well, your, your perspective is extremely welcome here today, Andy, and uh, looking forward to getting into the discussion together. Anne, could we ask you to introduce yourself, please? Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to stop myself from saying good morning because I'm calling in from Houston, Texas. Um, so it's 6.23 here for me, so it'll probably get brighter in here as we go on. Um, I'm Anne McNamara. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Visualization at Texas A&M University. And I had the good fortune to meet Alex a good few years ago at Augmented World Expo. And um, Alex very kindly invited me over to ARVR Innovate subsequently. So it was my great excuse to get home to Galway every year. Um, but this year, I guess we have to do things a little bit differently. Um, I'm delighted to be here, very interested in AR and VR, initially AR, but then um, realized that due to kind of location constraints that I could do a lot of AR, um, you know, sandbox testing in VR. Um, so have a lot of research projects, really excited to talk to everybody this morning. Thanks for having me. Fantastic. Thank you, Anne, and, and look forward to, to learning more about all of that as we get through the discussion. And uh, last but not least, and glad you could make it, Brian, uh, could we? Uh, could I invite you to introduce yourself to, to the audience, please? Certainly. Uh, my name is Brian Vaughan. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Media in Technological University Dublin. And please excuse me, as all things go, my, my voice has failed me this morning, but I'll do my best. I'm also the director of the Virtual Interaction Research Lab at TU Dublin. So we're a research space for students from undergrads up to postdoc to research in areas like mixed reality, AR, VR, things like language learning, immersive learning. That tends to be a lot of the focus we, we're finding in academia at the moment, but we're also an applied research lab that works with a number of industry partners across uh, the pharmaceutical industry, manufacturing, even areas like cultural heritage. So we're a very much <laughs> agile research space, but uh, with the technology that it is, it has to be very applied in, in what, what it's doing. Great, Th thanks for that, Brian. And also look forward to getting all the various insights from you, from your experience and from your entrepreneurial activities in, in, in all of that. So kicking off the discussion then, um, I'd just like to pose some questions to you guys, really just to kick things off, bit of an icebreaker. Um, perhaps Andy, if I could ask you just to give your overview of, you know, what is the state of the art with AR and VR devices today? We've seen Mark Zuckerberg recently saying that creation of an AR headset is, you know, one of the most difficult challenges of the decade. Um, so, so where are things at with devices, AR and VR wise at the moment? Sure, yeah, I, I, I actually saw you, I think you commented on, on an article on LinkedIn about that last night on the <laughs> on the Mark Zuckerberg quote, and, it, and he's not wrong, you know, it's kind of so like, the, it's it, it's kind of like the, the, the great hope for augmented reality, it, 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 it seems to be in a, a Oh, it might be a falsehood in people waiting for Apple's AR glasses if if they magically appear, you know, kind of. Uh, and people used to like uh, used to wait for an Apple TV, like an Apple actual TV. And some people are waiting for an, uh, an Apple dr driverless car. So kind of it, it, it could be. But I, I, I suppose in reality, kind of a main reality is probably in in a very good place at, at the minute. Potentially not so much in in devices, more in software. So, so it's kind of things like uh, Apple's. Airkit 4, which is our development kit for kind of b b building our, our, our mentality, 
is pretty advanced. Like you know, so kind of just it, you know, it, 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 it uses things like like face structure tracking. You know, people occlusion. Kind of if 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 you have a high end iPhone, the DJI iPhone 12 Pro or the iPad Pro, it has lidar sensor. So a lidar sensor. So kind of it has a depth API. So kind of you, you can really start kind of doing some interesting things in augmented reality when you fully understand the distance of everything around you. You know, like a. a from the cameras, so kind of in in software terms, you know, so in mobile AR, kind of like really good stage. And the thing is, as the last panel was saying, like lots of reason AR and don't realize, you know, Instagram filters, kind of Snapchat, kind of things that is all AR. On the on the AR, the the device side is kind of changing all all the time. There's no like there isn't a killer consumer AR glasses. There just isn't. It's like there's ones like the the, the, the Vuvuzix Blade, um, which I think costs about five hundred quid, maybe. Um, that it seems like Netflix on it, and that interesting enough, but it's it's it, it's not in in, in in any way widespread. Um, I, I I think at, at the last kind of physical AR VR innovation, I tried on the Hololens, and um, I wasn't impressed by it. But a month ago, the U.S. Army had just signed a, a twenty-two billion dollar contract. We, 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 Microsoft for 120,000 custom Hololenses. You know, so kind of it, it's actually like I think people think kind of AR glasses aren't anywhere kind of uh, like this, so they aren't usable yet. But there's actually like pockets where people are using them for a decent use cases. And just to, to, to touch quickly on VR as well before I didn't use up everyone else's time. Um, I'd say in a nutshell, VR headsets in the consumer space are here. And they're really good. So kind of three hundred dollars, you know, you, you, you get an Oculus Quest two. I play some really good games on it, you know. So it's so kind of it's 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 more to do to to do with potentially the marketing of them or the 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 just aren't why aren't widespread enough in enterprise terms. VR kind of is uh, the, the devices are mainly used for things like like training and that. But in so as in in hardware terms, VR devices are kind of in decent state as well. For both um, consumer and enterprise, but on the AR side, it's more enterprise in niche pockets. You know, if that makes great. sense. Great. Yeah. No. Thanks for that overview, Andy. It makes great sense. I guess you know you called out mobile in terms of AR, which seems to be most of the where the recent progress is at, and you you called out some of the the software platforms. So maybe Anne, following up on the software sure. platform topic, you know, what are the dominant and what are the um, the market leading AR VR software platforms and tools today? So definitely for AR, um, Andy already mentioned it. You know, a Apple's AR kit would be probably the, one of the top ones with AR core. So that'd be for for mobile AR. And um, in terms of VR, it's interesting that these um, software packages that were originally intentioned and still very much in use for game development and um, for real time graphics are being used to create content for VR. So things like Unreal Engine. Um, Unreal is actually pretty amazing. Um, they, they definitely chose the name well. Um, they recently released something called MetaHumans. I don't know if any of you had a chance to look at that, but it's very highly realistic human characters that you can build yourself and groom. So you can literally build your own digital twin. And again, again it's real time, which is what makes it particularly um, impressive and stunning. And they also have several plugins that can help with a lot of applications. For exa example, um, Cesium, which is um, 3D spatial um, information that you can overlay um, on the game, um, which then you can export to to the VR. And so I would say those two are the big big ones. Of course, Euphoria is a big player in the space. Yeah. Um, back a little bit to what Andy said about the hardware, an interesting um, headset um, from a Finnish company is called Vario, V-A-R-J-O. Um, and they have, I just ordered one of them. I'm really excited to get it. Um, it has it's kind of a, a kind of a, a hybrid VR AR um, headset again like Andy I'm not particularly impressed with the hololens but it does have application in certain niche areas right and the vario with foveated rendering and various mm -hmm. eye tracking and pretty advanced device right so it's in terms exactly. of Andy's commentary about AR being probably most advanced in the enterprise space it's a pretty heavy hitting tool. Right, and it also has a wider field of view, although I did see the Vive 3 came out for consumer this week, so that has a pretty wide field of view as well and very high resolution. Um, so I think that the, I mean, I think the technology will keep advancing. I think, um, you know, you mentioned software, so I think one of the key challenges for us is going to be content creation and 
you know, having a platform where we can quickly spin up, um, you know, content to just to, to view on these devices. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, Anne. That's 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 enlightening. And maybe Brian, to throw one at you then. Just you know, Andy, so, or, um, Anne was asking about talking about content. So, what are the leading applications and uh, games applications use cases that you find in AR and VR today? Just in terms of closing out on state of the art. I think definitely, as Andy was saying about consumer VR games, like I think there's something like the Oculus 2 is beginning to be seen more as like a console as opposed to just a VR headset. I think that's very much the way it seems to be pushed is that like, you know, you've got your PS5, you've got your Xboxes, but you also have your Oculuses and it's it's within a same price point. It's actually cheaper than a lot of them. Um, it's a fantastic headset. It does so much stuff really well. And I think one of the biggest advances and the reason it's doing so well is just the ease of use. You know, we kind of went from this outside-in tracking um, to, to where we are now with it on the headset, and it's it's just made a huge difference. In terms of the kind of non-consumer stuff, seeing ba on VR, definitely training and simulation, especially since COVID. And I know that's something we might talk about later, but yeah. since COVID, people are asking very quickly, questions they've been asking for a while, but now they're, they're literally saying, how do we do it? Now, putting people in these realistic environments you know, in their own home to to help train um, in various areas across various industries. I think that's the kind of main area that we've seen in the lab, in the collaborations we've done with industry. Training mm -hmm. simulation is huge. And it's not even a case of, you know, fully replicating the, the environment that people would work in. It's, it's more about focus training, about if you have a two-hour task in industrial manufacture and repair, what's what's one or two aspects of that that are most problematic and can you do something around that in vr like a 20 or 30 minute very short sharp uh, intervention i think originally people kind of thought this is great we can do all our training in this put on headsets and we'd have this magical land of everyone training in this highly detailed environment and i think it's got more realistic now where people are saying well actually it should be part of our existing training regime and it should fit into it you know so classroom-based learning still has a place and the the training simulation in vr can fit into that where you can focus on certain aspects in very great detail in this, you know, engaging environment. I think with AR, AR is really interesting. So I, like Andy, I think I tried the HoloLens 1 at AR VR Innovate, I think last year, or actually pre-COVID. And I wasn't impressed because it was like looking through a letterbox into a virtual world. But I've been hugely impressed with the HoloLens 2. So we, we, you know, we got one in the lab to start building things with. To be honest, the thing I'm most impressed about is how easy it is to use and how well it just integrates with existing platforms so you know you plug it in you basically have windows um and with all the windows functionality and all the microsoft functionality and i think that's one of the the powerful things about it at the moment and you know in my experience again dealing with industry from what i've seen what they're doing it's all about you know um remote remote help it's all about training it's all about repair um you know out of the box your hololens 2 can help solve a lot of problems with you, you know with dynamics 365 and teams Yep. So I think on both sides, you know, training and simulation um, in terms of AR and VR. On the consumer side, it's games and like, you know, like Andy and Anne were saying, there is no real consumer AR headset. You know, people aren't going to go out and buy a HoloLens to play some games or have some fun. It's too expensive and it's too, it's too powerful a piece of equipment and too fragile. I think on the, on the mobile side, I used to think that was very, I used to think that might be a little bit gimmicky. But with the way phone hardware is accelerating, like Andy mentioned, the iPhone 12 with a LiDAR scanner, you know, people are going out and doing like 3D scans of environments and uploading them and sharing them. And I think things like that really will supercharge AR and mobile phones. So people will have fantastic AR capabilities in their pockets. And then, you know, it's up to the software and the developers to do something really interesting with that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's that's certainly comes out strongly from the entire panel discussion. You know, there's there are particular applications and use cases for where AR and VR in certain configurations make a lot of sense, yes. and um, and you've you know you're talking to some of them, Brian. I guess just following on from what you're saying, kind of takes us maybe into a broader discussion about AR and VR. I mean, has the technology plateaued? You know, like uh, like it seemed like five years ago. You know, every year that went by, there was talk of a new device. It ended up in the Magic Leap device. Perhaps the device that was released was a little bit less than what the expectations mm -hmm. were were led to believe um you know i know in daiquiri we ambitions about having very large field of view but the physics restricted us to sort of 53 degrees diagonal and you know it was down about bending light through glass in a small form factor so there's some 
laws of physics were constraining reality, unfortunately. But all of those laws of physics aside, ha have the technologies plateaued? Um, and I throw, throw it open to the plat to, to the panel here. Um, I mean, is what we have now pretty much as good as it gets? And it's a case of using it to great effect, or should we expect more to come? Yeah, I can jump in there, Paul. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a case, like, there's a couple of different ways to, 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 to look at it. I think perhaps there's a consolidation of, of kind of effort and money being spent in kind of by the big players, you know? So it's so, so kind of like, the, like that contract which Microsoft got with the US Army, like I, I think there's a few other smaller players like ODG or like who, 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 who would have gone for contracts like that and kind of Microsoft getting that is going to kill off their kind of like these startups roadmaps because they just can't compete with kind of, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, and it's, it, I think it's kind of what, what, what we'll see is an evolution of what these things are. So, so, so it's a kind of, a, of the $22 billion, which, you know, it, uh, which, which could be spent, I think it's over 10 years. Um, I think probably about 4 billion of that is the hardware and the rest is, is cloud services. And I and consulting uh, and Azure uh, kind of uh, sister service of Microsoft. So because like you know the, with the U.S. Army kind of on from the, the limited de 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 details are given, is a whole lot of AI information fed to the, to, to their to their troops while they're out in the field or on where where they are. So it's more kind of I'd say um, like, potentially the the hardware is 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 pat on. I'd probably say it's potentially slowing down as com as companies like. Uh, like Facebook kind of know, they know what the problems are and they know how to solve them and it's just gonna take time to, 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 to do it. But, yeah. but, but, but so the use cases for these devices is gonna grow exponentially as other things like AI and, and, and 5Gs is added on top, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think that, that Microsoft program is probably more of the future soldier program rather than the AR soldier yeah. program. <laughs> AR is a part of it and, and that makes good sense. Um, anybody else have any any contrary or agreeing opinions to Andy's on any of those topics? Not really contrary, but complementary, I guess. Um, you know, there's some ways that we can leverage the limitations of visual perception to kind of overcome some of those physical um, limitations that you talked about. So, for example, um, one of the one of the themes of my research, I guess, is eye tracking because a lot of these devices have eye tracking built into them at the moment. So if you can think about, you know, for even just for even just for display purposes, you know, rather than have everything in full resolution, just have the portion of the image in full resolution that you um, are looking at, and that's called foveated rendering. But another um, approach is that you can actually um, guide people to look at things by um, by making them dynamic, right? So if something moves in your peripheral vision, you're going to adjust your gaze that you actually look at that. Um, so you can do things like that to take attention away from or from something that you don't want people to look at over here or bring the attention to something you do want them to look at. Um, so there are definitely some way, some research um, studies that are underway that are looking at, you know, how do we use perception and, and take advantage of our, our complex visual system to kind of help make these things a bit more realistic. It's yeah. that very interesting, and that is a research topic that you're active in on. That's right. Yeah, I have um, I have several um, you know, projects going on at the moment that um, kind of take advantage of that fact. Um, so one of them, we well, so, like I mentioned at the start, I started out looking at AR, so mobile AR, and you know, very quickly when you populate a mobile screen with any virtual content, you're you're using up your your real estate, right? So. Um, how do you best present the information that's most relevant to the user at a specific time and maintaining that context, right? Because the AR elements typically are used to give you more information about the physical world around you. And um, so um, the idea was to use eye tracking. So if, if I'm looking at a couch, then give me more information about the couch. If I'm looking at the chair, give me more information about the chair. And that way you can kind of m minimize the visual clutter that you have. Um, so that's one of the main projects we're using, but we're also using eye tracking um, for other measurements as well. So for example, pupil dilation can be an indicator of stress or blink frequency can be an indicator of stress. Um, so you can tell if people are getting fatigued with a task or if they're getting stressed out by a task. And sometimes that's what you want. You want to induce the same stress that they'd have in the physical world. Um, yeah. But other times you kind of want to get the people out of, of the, the simulation.
yeah, yeah, no, very interesting. Um, Brian, any any thoughts on that topic? I think I, I think it's interesting what Anne and Andy were saying. I, I would say it's more it's matured because now like Anne's talking about, well, okay, we have VR, we have AR, what can we do around eye gaze? Mm -hmm. My background's in speech science. I'm interested in look if you put people in an immersive collaborative environment. You know, I've done a lot of work around measuring um, communication ability through speech. Like, what can you do if you put people in these collaborative environments that, you know, they accept that they're real once certain conditions are met. And, you know, like Anne was saying there, um, you know, they can potentially feel the same stressors that they do. What else can you do? You know, can you put people in situations to, to help them in numerous ways? Like, there's a lot of work um, and examples of it being used for therapeutic purposes. You know, um, I know in the States there's you know, uh, universities of looking at it for PTSD, um, uh, looking at phobias, things like that, putting people in situations that are safe, but they still feel the same essential stressors and effect. And what can we do when we put people in these things? I think like a few years ago, you know, having conversations with people and saying, well, what would we use AR for? What's the use case? What's the business case? And now certainly on the business industrial side, it's kind of a no-brainer really the use case and the business case is fairly straightforward and easy to explain i think vr is kind of plateau a little bit and it's kind of going little bumps and waves but i think that's gonna can kind of continue to mature as well even like at the moment you know we're not even discussing what's the technology useful for we're discussing about well what can we use it for now it's here now it's used um, and i think one of the exciting areas would is going to be kind of mobile based they are you know i'm reminded of the fact i don't know when it happened but you know one day you search for something on, on Google on your phone and it'll give you the option to view the, the thing in AR. I think if you search for certain animals and that just kind of came in, you know, with no real big fanfare. I certainly didn't notice anything yet. You know, a year or two ago, if that was brought in, it would be an amazing new thing. Look at this. You can look at these 3D creatures on, on your phone. And I know, you know, when my kids were at home, homeschooling, you know, the BBC had an app and you could look at all these various historical artifacts through AR. And I think it's matured now. We're saying, OK, what are the really interesting things that we can do with it. So just to kind of finish up, like one of the areas I lecture in is user interaction design. So what what do we have to change about the way we interact with the world through using these devices? And I think it's a really interesting kind of interaction design problem. So now we're asking questions about interaction design because the technology is so mature, we don't have to worry with fiddly wires and sensors so much, you can pop it on and off you go. So what can we do? What can we add in on top of it? So it's almost like a platform technology at this stage. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got me thinking, listening to you, Brian, um, you know, many different threads there. I mean, one part of me is thinking, is AR a great way for people who are making movies to explain what's going on in movies? Because practically every sci-fi you have uses AR, right? It's nearly ubiquitous um, in, in many different scenarios. So certainly for people making movies, AR is, 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 is current. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the real world, as you're saying, uh, you know, many, many different cases. So I guess build, building from that, what are the key use cases, you know, for folks who are, who are attending the panel today and are, are trying to assess and get, get, get a flavor of where VR is at? Um, I think, you know, you mentioned COVID earlier. We will, I think, we, let's talk about that specifically in a little while. Yeah. But, but even COVID aside, what, what are the use cases where AR and VR really gives value today? I think it's still like training simulation in VR, but then on the AR side of things, you know, I've had talks with people around cultural heritage applications of, okay, you can't mm -hmm. go to a museum, you can't go out to various locations. What Can you bring it into your house in some way? Can you bring it in in an interesting way where you can somehow kind of experience it in a, in a, in a, in a limited sense, because it's not going to be the same as actually being there, but at least people are kind of asking these questions now and not seeing it as, oh, it's gimmicky. We can make, you know, this, this you know, the, the Mona Lisa appear on someone's wall. Well, you know, that has applications because now the technology's got so good that you can have these high resolution images that it's, it's it's a fairly compelling experience. So I think on that side of things, it's changing. People are finding more, say, less, you know, industrial or science focused applications, you know, so around cultural heritage and things like that. I think that kind of thing is, is really interesting. Like COVID has accelerated it in many ways in terms of you know, the, the VR, VR training and simulation side of things. Um, so I think... I think again, like it's people are asking questions. What can we do with it? Like you look at the movie industry, look at the Lion King with John Favreau was using, you know, virtual cameras and VR headsets to position, and he could walk around and go, "We will shoot yeah. here, we will shoot there." Yeah. You know, and as Anne was talking about with Unreal, you know, the Mandalorian used these virtual sets, and they look absolutely fantastic. 
Yeah. So the quality of what people can do from a kind of artistic point of view, as the barriers get lower and lower. I mean, I even think of Unity you have, have their um, kind of AR, uh, the, their XR interaction toolkit makes it very easy to build VR applications, but then they also have their kind of AR add-in where you don't have to do any coding, 3D kind of drag and drop. And you have test environments as well, virtual test environments. So you don't, you know, you overcome that issue of I've built it, but now I've got to test and it's a bit laborious. So like, I think the barriers to entry are coming down so quickly, almost too quick to keep up. And it's exciting yeah. because more people who aren't from a technical background, who don't know how to program, can actually start doing some really cool things in it. So the blockers are coming down as well, right? There's, yes. there's, there's easier to use, more accessible tools. Um, I guess it's, there's a pull from different applications which are wanting to use it, so therefore the tools are evolving. Um, so to, to, to people listening in who might, might have dabbled in VR or AR, who might be wanting to get involved, I mean, what, you know, what, what, I guess Unreal Unity we've, we've, we've spoken about, is there anything else there that you should look at? I think, I think people have such capability in their, in their, in their pocket with their phone. And mm. I think any of those tools, like, you know, Unity, you can be up and running with an AR application following like a tutorial online for an hour or two mm -hmm. and have something on your phone. And, you know, I've done that with students in class and, you know, by the end of the two hours, they have a little cube floating on the ground or in the air or something, something really simple. But the questions that they start asking then isn't, you know, how do I make the cube bigger or how do I program this or that? It's like, what else can I put in there? If I can make this appear, what else can I make appear? And they start th thinking creatively because those barriers have come down. So, I think things like certainly Unity, because that's our main platform of choice, even Unreal as well. You know, they're not really game engines; they're content creation engines, mm -hmm. and they're lowering those barriers all the time. So, I think, yeah, like I would say to anyone who wants to get stuck in, you know, download a personal copy of Unity. You probably have a phone that can run AR in some form, and there's a, like there's a million and one tutorials out there. So, even just getting an understanding of it, so you can do more advanced stuff if you want to enroll in a course or something like that. You can do that. It's not so specialist now that so many people are cut out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah so, um, I, oh, go ahead, Andy. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. I will, I'll just echo that with a quick anecdote. Yesterday, I read about somebody who took their iPhone to a factory and did a LiDAR scan um, of the of all the, the piping and everything, and then had a scan of their, of their robot that they wanted to make sure that it, it would fit. Um, and so they brought that over into Unity and, and did it all in one day. And it was really compelling. Yeah. yeah, it's extremely useful to be able to do something like that rather than setting up a, a 3D scanner that takes time and doing a very precise yeah. mapping of the environment, which is costly as well. Andy, you were going to say something there? Yeah, no, it, it, I just had to jump in and kind of mention like the native I, 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 options as well. Like, I, I, I'm a massive fan of building things natively on in Apple. Mm -hmm. I just I just am. But it's um like it's it's the the the, the dress decay which you mentioned earlier on AirKit 4, it abstracts away all, all this difficult stuff and it, it really is really simple to, to to use. And I think even I think three years ago I think when Air Kit 2 it was out my company made for um is it, it, it was for the co when the Coder Dojo events. Um, an event reality app. Um, it's 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 basically real simple. You, you shoot things all around you, loads of colorful sense things. And we, we, we open source those, I write a big, and we, we release a big, a big tutorial how, how, how to make it. But like, it's really simple. Like, and it, like anybody who kind of, I suppose, who, who can code can, can build something that looks looks really good. And um, it's, I think it's all kind of, it's, it's probably an, an untapped market in, 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 in game development. Like, do, 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 I don't use enough AR games out there, and I think perhaps if, if the developers really realize how easy it is to, to, to build things that they are, like to, to, there should be a, a, a whole lot more, you know. Well, let's hope there's a number of them listening to you today, Andy, and, and take up your advice, and, and we can get to enjoy those games in the near future. Um, okay, maybe maybe let's move on. So, COVID cropped up earlier, right? And none of us can forget the year and the bit that we've just gone through. So. Um, you know, you read that certain AR and VR applications have certainly accelerated their usage, like e-shopping or, or other things that have also accelerated over the COVID time. Um, you know, so what, what impact has COVID-19 had on AR VR? Maybe a very open question just to invite you guys, um, if you could share your views on that. Sure. Um, I could jump in again. Like I think, kind of from um, it's so it sparked our our interest at an enterprise level at Vior again. You know, and kind of like Vior is kind of one of these things like, you know, like the the Gartner 
like hype cycles and that kind of they come and go a few years ago we were quite interested in the or for training and and obviously like as, as brian is saying like the training is absolutely valuable you use case if you've got like tens of thousands of staff to train and, and, and will cut down your your, your training costs etc for, for 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 us we looked at it for various things but to to, 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 to be honest most of our innovation work as we go into ai and machine learning you know kind of based on all the text data we we, we have but uh, so to, to answer your we win the question like covid has us looking at at it again, mainly for on, on in terms of to, to this to Zoom or to, to you know to Microsoft Teams kind of like we're, we're, we're just interested is is there a better way for kind of large amounts of people, especially when it's large amounts of people. So when, like you know four or five people, it's be okay. But if if you want to run a team meeting when it's like you know fifty people, um, is it better if if you were all in in a virtual room and we can display large amounts of information all around us? I mean like I. I, I I gave a talk in in uh, in in VR about AOR about two, two years ago, I think, for, for for James Corbett, and I really enjoyed it. Like you know, and it's kind of it's um, but th that's the sort of thing that if 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 COVID hadn't arrived, we wouldn't be looking at. And kind of it's it's uh, I'd say I'd say like, even when when COVID's gone, hopefully soon, we'll still be interested in, in that sort of thing because I wouldn't say we're going to spend as much money on travel as we used to. You know. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I think some of that is, is bound to stick. Um, um, and Brian, you guys got any any thoughts on that? Go just leveraging what Andy said. Uh, Vive has its own software, like where you can go in and build, you know, virtual worlds where you can all come and conference, and they actually have their own training and their own um, meetings in there. And you can just, you know, even if you're just going in to watch a PowerPoint, you can pull up a virtual screen and all watch it together, kind of in this three D space. Yeah. So I Definitely, I would I would agree with what Andy said that it has sparked a resurgence um, in in the enterprise space, but also in education. I mean, if you have um, students that are going to be at home, I mean, how can you how can you complement their learning? The classroom is never going to go away, right? But I mean, how can you complement their learning and let them take a little bit of the classroom home with them? Mm -hmm. And so we've been spinning up a lot of ideas of well, can you um, can you create some content that will help. So for example, if you're trying to do a chemistry lab, can you simulate that and use your phone maybe to interact with the pieces? I mean, even if you can set up the apparatus before you get to the the physical lab and practice that, um, I think that adds value. So yeah. definitely I think COVID has actually boosted AR and VR rather than hindered it in, in many ways. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly agree. I mean. I mean, on one side, as a parent, I had a, a son, a 12-year-old, who was playing Beat Saber on his Oculus Rift. Um, <laughs> and I would have much rather he was playing, you know, multiply the hard numbers together on the Oculus Rift or some other educational content, but we just didn't have access to anything. Well, okay, we had some geographical and science-type content mm -hmm. we pushed towards him, but nothing structured that complemented and clicked in with what he was doing in school. So certainly in terms of resilience of how we educate our next generations into the future, um, that, that makes a whole lot of sense to me as well. Um, that, that's really interesting, Paul. I'm actually teaching a class on VR in the fall, and we're actually partnering with the local school um, uh, school system here. There's a school system for you know underprivileged children, but they just got a grant for, they got a grant to buy a whole bunch of HMDs, a whole bunch of vibes and some, some um, hardware, um, but they have no content. So the project for the class will be to build the content. So very interesting point there. Well, yeah. I, mean. I think that's interesting on the education side because there's always been a difference between educational games, which a lot of times are very boring because they're about education, not about games. And then games that are actually educational, like, you know, when I was younger, I learned about all the seven wonders of the world playing Civilization 4 or 3 or something like that. You know, and there's good research out there about, like, there's actual research on using Civilization in class to educate people. But the focus of it is an education, just is kind of almost a byproduct. And I think that's interesting about the VR, like, again, you know, my, my kids um, were at home and I was able to give them a, a, a fairly east, decent experience in, they were studying Egypt in school before lockdown. And I was able to put them into this app on the Oculus Store, which is like an ancient Egyptian tomb, really high resolution. It was fantastic. And they really loved it. They really got a lot out of it. But there is a serious lack of content. Like you mentioned Beat Saber. My kids love that. If you could stick some numbers on the blocks where they have to hit yeah. the rocks, 
answer, I think they would be more compelled to do that than to sit down and do it on, you know, Seesaw or whatever it is they're using. So yeah. I think it's kind of accelerated that because people are more accepting of that. And I even found with some of our kind of, you know, training simulation projects, people are just more willing to try it who might have been a bit skeptical if it being in the workplace and they say, okay, you're going to have to do VR. They, this is another thing to add on to me. Whereas if they're sitting at home, putting on a VR headset for a short period of time is actually maybe a break or a different way of doing things. And, you know, popping a, an Oculus 2 in its case in the post and sending it down somehow having a day or two, like it's, that's your training or that's part of your training. Yeah. And I think it's interesting with COVID because it's going to be around for a while. I think things will change maybe permanently, but even with training, if you're bringing people in, you know, I think gone are the days where it'll be like a whole day. It'll be very short and focused. And in that case, you might want people to be onboarded before they come into it. So, you know what? Send them out headsets, get them all familiar with it, get them to walk through it virtually. And then when you come in, it's very targeted and focused and you're in and out, as opposed to, you know, taking a day or two or three to do something that could be a lot more focused. So I think those aspects of it, the non-technological aspects, the social acceptance of this form of, of working has, has, has certainly changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's less uh, geeky or out there. It's more normal, right, in terms yeah. of the technology overall. I mean, just, just as the discussion goes there, it springs to mind, I mean, there's some folks who've been you know, involved with this event before, VR Education, MeetingRoom.io, you know, some folks that are in our community locally who are, you know, very involved in this space of virtual meeting space. And I can see in the chat that Alex and James Spalding have been talking about Mozilla Hubs, which they've both used um, for, for, for events. Um, just looking at the clock, we probably have time for one more quick, quick topic. So maybe just final words, um, just to challenge you guys. So to ask you each, maybe, you know, what is one thing which is coming or you believe needs to happen to move state of the art on significantly um, in, in, in the near to mid future? Um, yeah, sure. I, I'd say kind of the, um, it, it, you may not want me to mention Apple AR glasses, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> but um, it's, 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 I, I, I I don't just mean Apple, right? If if I, could, I know Facebook, kind of their, I can't, I can't remember the, the, the name of their of their VR lab, but kind of a, one of the main problems the Facebook are, are working on is the size of headsets. You know, so kind of like the like headsets headsets are just quite large and heavy, and and they don't suit all people of all backgrounds. If you were, I know you mentioned it, you made it a part that people wearing certain 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 things on their head, it just doesn't suit them. But um, so kind of. A, I think kind of if you know if these headsets can get much smaller and and they're much easier to to to, to wear, I think it'll like will help advance them a, a lot. I, I, I say that on, on the VR side, obviously on the on the AR side, if if someone does bring out like an, an incredible pair of AR glasses, it'll be it'll be as big as change from kind of you know laptops to iPhones. You know, kind of, it'll just become like all the marketing ideas, and you get all the information around you and stuff. But so, as in, like, will it ever happen in time soon? Probably not. So, kind of, the um, I say on the, I say kind of, it's it's a steady, it's a steady progression. As we're saying, there's already a lot of AR capabilities there. More and more apps will, will start using them. I know five G is potentially a bit, a bit of cliche, cliche now, but five G will allow. Mm -hmm. Like like the apps to uh, uh, to offload kind of AI capabilities, which you know to the edge, which will feed in a lot more information to AI. Or so I, I, I expect. Kind of said earlier on, like the like uh, t t things that need to happen are already happening. It's kind of it, it's a steady it's it, it, it's, a, it's a steady progression. But right. on the hard, on the hardware side, it, it's all about just making things smaller. You know? Okay. So we, we'll send a letter to Santa Claus for you asking for a set of <laughs> Apple glasses as soon as they're available. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've 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 been asking for a few years now, Paul, and it hasn't happened. Yeah. Yet, so. yeah. well, we'll get Alex. See if, if his voice has any, <laughs> any bigger weight than any of ours. And uh, any ideas? Oh gosh, one thing, um, Paul, is really tough. Um, I think, um, and I think Brian will probably hit on this as well. It's we it's have you more than one, Anne. Andy had about oh. ten there, so you you can yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um. I think um, one well one thing that I'm interested in is how do we use peripheral devices to you know enhance the VR or the AR. So for example, I talked already about eye tracking, um, but we can also use things like heart rate monitors, um, or there's even these little devices now that you can put on your forehead that are supposed to detect brain activity. And even at a rudimentary level, um, you know they can be they can be useful inputs to the VR. To the simulation, and um, I was I was reading just this week about the company Jump VR, where 
the the founder wanted to go base jumping um but didn't really want to take the risk of going base jumping hence the name jump so he he um developed this company and they have a full haptic body suit so whatever you're feeling in the in the vr simulation you're actually feeling in the physical world as well so i think more mappings like that i mean things as simple things even just like um, studies have shown that just having a fan on you when there's wind in the in the simulation will actually um, enhance your your immersion and your sense of presence. So yeah. if, you, if you take some of the rides over at Orlando on the Disney or Universal Studios, I mean, it's heat, water, yeah. wind, and change of space. So for sure, they're they're a magic formula. Yeah, definitely. And so yeah, I think I think just how do we incorporate all the extra measures that will feed in and give us a better experience in the VR. Okay, cool. Super. Brian, last word to I, you, I'll, sir. I'll keep it quick. I'll, on the non-technical side, because I think, you know, you know, Anne and Andy have really covered the technical side. I think there's there's a role for, say, the arts and humanities, to, especially sociologists, because there's issues around gender. You know, more women than men get simulator sick. More women than men feel uncomfortable putting on a VR headset in, in, in an environment with other, other people around them. Um, it's very much anecdotal because there hasn't been large scale research done on it, but I know certainly, you know, female students are a lot more uncomfortable putting on a VR headset when it's being demonstrated to students. Um, so there are kind of things that need to be looked into. I think they can feel yeah. into this, the, the manufacturing and uh, development side of things about how do you make these this technology far more equitable and usable by, you know, 50% of the population or whatever percentage of the 50%. I think there's an ethical aspect as well because there's research coming out now saying, the way you move and the way you operate within VR, even in the physical environment while you're in VR, can is personally identifiable information. And there's some good questions being asked around, you know, if you're moving to cloud-based AR and having like a persistent AR layer where I place a digital object in, a, in some place and you come along and regardless of what platform you're using, you'll be able to interact with it because it just persists in this digital layer. Who yep. owns the scan of your house or your kid's bedroom or your kitchen? Or, you know, if you're scanning that and putting an object in it and that's going up to the cloud in some form, who owns that? I think there are questions need to be asked. And then just touching finally on something we talked about, like education, it'd be, it's a fantastic, powerful tool, I think, VR. But, you know, our day schools, for example, going to be getting VR kits if other schools are getting VR kits. Like my kids are lucky enough to, you know, have me move the lab home and have all this gear. But what about kids who don't have access to it? You know, are we going to have to be very mindful of this digital divide, which we always see with technological development, you know, when computers start to become widespread and used at home, there was a big divide between people who were you know, able to use them because they had them at an early age. Like my kids can use touchscreen, no problem, can use a mouse and a computer and everything. What about kids who don't have access to the same level of technology? So on the educational side of things, I think it's huge potential, but I think there's a role there for, you know, sociologists and others to be looking at and asking these questions, which I think points to the maturity of the technology as well, of that we're finally at the stage where we can really get our teeth into these and start answering some of these interesting questions. So I think I think those questions have to be explored, not necessarily answered, but start to be explored to really move the technology forward in a kind of more social um, and useful way across society. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking as you're as you're making those interesting points, Brian, that the only, the only downside to our being out of time now is we can't actually physically meet up and continue the conversation offline in person, but uh, look forward to being able to do that again soon. Well, look, thanks, everybody, for um, a really, really interesting and stimulating discussion. I to bite my lip to, uh, to not jump in and make it chaotic because I've been extremely interested <laughs> in, in all of the various different topics. So thanks to everybody for making time. Thanks, Alex, for, uh, for inviting us to be part of this. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, want thank to thank, I want to thank Paul for, for chairing the discussion. Really intelligent. So many good points there. Um, I made some notes, but we'll try and have to distill it afterwards. And uh, just to let people know, it's in the chat there as well. There, there is a YouTube channel for AR VR Innovate, and we did put last year's discussions, most of them at least, online. They're absolutely fantastic quality discussion last year and this year. So just, uh, if you wouldn't mind, just click on that YouTube link there in the chat and you can subscribe. And that means that you you won't miss the, the discussion when, we, when I do upload it, probably over the next uh, week or two, we, we'll, we'll do that. So uh, just again, Paul, thanks for expertly chairing it. And lovely to see you again. We really hope we'll yeah. share get you over to Dublin uh, next year. I'm, I'm confident that it's going to happen. Andy uh, and Brian, thanks so much as well. And uh, Brian uh, and I work closely on lots of projects and Brian's doing amazing work in the, 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 the VR lab here at TU Dublin. So do check out the uh, TU Dublin uh, Open Labs booth so you can get more information. There's lots of opportunity. We do want to collaborate with industry 
uh, on so many uh, dimensions, as I know uh, Brian uh, agrees, and he's got some great um, researchers working with him. So lots of opportunity there.